Um, so, laws of exponents. We talked about yesterday was that the laws of exponents, anytime you're multiplying um, some type of algebraic expression, it could be could be monomial, binomial, there's set rules that we have for doing it. So one of the first examples we talked about yesterday was something like this. 3x y to the fourth z times negative 4 x to the fifth y to the sixth. You can multiply any monomial together, any binomial, any trinomial, or combination of them, and it still follows the same laws of exponents. So the, the basic rules, we had the product rule, which is multiplying. We had a power rule where you have one frenzy and a power outside of it, like one item and a power on it. And then we had the power power rule, which is like multiple items with a power on it. So in this case, when we're looking at this, we're just going to multiply the two together. The shortcut that I told you yesterday was that you really are only multiplying the numbers you know. The variables you can't actually multiply. So, for instance, 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. That's easy. Everything else, you can't do anything because you don't know it. It's a variable, right? So just throw them in the back, combine them all because you really can't do anything with them. So, in this case, we have an x to the first, x to the fifth, that makes what? x to the sixth. You can combine them because you really don't know how to multiply them, so you can't do anything with them. The y's, we have what, 10 of them because you have 4 and 6. That's 10. And it looks like we have a z. And yeah, that's my z. I got a little tail. So that's your answer, right? That's a shortcut. If you cannot honestly remember like that you have to add the variables like that, like you can't remember it's 4 plus 6 gives you the 10 y's, you can do the old school method of doing it, which is what they call um, the definition of an exponent, where what I mean by definition of an exponent is like if you have x to the fifth, that means that whatever the base is, you have five of them, right? Like this. And they're always being multiplied together. You could do that to this problem. You could expand these all out, where you have 5x's, 6y's, you have 4y's, 1x, 1z, and then you can rearrange and you can put them all next to each other so that you'll have a ton of variables across the board, and then you can bring it back to this using a definition of an exponent again. Because you can't multiply variables. So you you know you'd have a bunch of things written like this, and then you just combine them all back down into the simplest form using that definition, what an exponent actually means. So that's in case like, it's a fail safe, in case you're like, God, do we add, do we multiply? That type of thing. Questions, comments about those? Do we feel comfortable with a problem like that? I think I gave you like, in your homework, I think I gave you like two of those, those, like that style, where they just have a couple numbers, a couple variables after. Now, don't get me wrong, there's going to be a couple that will have negative exponents. We're going to do those later, or we mix everything together. But I think right away in the beginning, I think there's a couple that are just simple numbers like that. Okay, next, we had power rule. So anytime you had a parenthesis, and we're going to put a power on it. Like this. In fact, let me change some of these. Uh, so it's going to be x squared, and let's go with a negative out front. All right, in this case, this is really, it's not really a power rule, it's a power of powers. You have multiple items on the inside of the parentheses with a power on the outside. These two rules, for some reason, to me, are exactly the same rule. They're exactly the same. Now, I understand why they have a difference, because if you have more than one item, you have to learn how to distribute correctly. But they have the same property. So you have to hand that 6 to everything in here if you have multiple items. If you don't, you just hand it to the one item that's in but everything will get it. So negative 3 will get the power of 6. The x squared will get a power of 6. The y to the fourth will get a power of 6. And the z will get a power of 6. Now, what's the rule for those variables that have the parentheses on them? How do we multiply. say it again? Multiply. You multiply. So 2 times 6, 4 times 6. So if there's a power with power, multiply. That was this first one. That's how they teach you how to do it. So negative 3 to the 6, what does that choose? Uh, it's 81 times another 3, times 81 times 3, 3, 243, and then times 3 again. It's 9, 12, 1, 729. So negative 729. Somebody double check my math. That could be possible. Type that in. No. Okay, all right. So 729, and then we have 
x to the 12, y to the 24, z to the 6. Okay, now, why did I say that was positive? Let's talk about that a little. Why did the negative 3 turn out to be positive? Please. It can't have a, like, it can't be negative if it's an exponent. It can't be negative with a certain type of exponent. You're correct. What type of exponent? Even. Evens cancel out the negative sign. Because if you think about, like, if we go back to that definition of what negative 3 to the 6 means, it means you have 6 negative 3s. You get the idea. And every two of them will cancel out. So if there's an even number of them, six of them, they cancel out. So you're right, right? So it matters what type of exponent you have. If that was a 5, now the answer is negative and it would be. Be negative because it had a power of five on. All right, now let's talk about that the item first because I actually wrote something incorrect just two seconds ago, and I got to make sure that you know the difference here. It came down to this thing. I actually had it written down incorrectly. When I wrote this, there's a difference between that and this, which I modified it. This, the negative sign is with the three, and you'll have six of them. If, if you see this in your textbook, like that, that answer, this answer on a calculator will be different than this one, because they're saying two different things. This means you're gonna take three to the sixth power, which is 729, and then they want the opposite of it, which is negative. If you put the parentheses around it, like I am now modified, that means that you're going to have a bunch of negative threes and the negatives will all cancel, so it'll be positive 729. Does that make sense? Like when there's a parenthesis and when there's not. Be careful of that. That's, the, that's probably one of the most common mistakes people make in Algebra 2, Algebra 1. They don't get the idea of the negative signs. The parentheses make all the difference. If they forget the parentheses, like this top one, you're just doing 3 to the 6 and then putting negative out front versus when it's on the inside. So it cancels. So apologies, I should have clarified that. Okay, what else do we have? I think, I think that would be it for that. Uh, let's talk about 3 to the 6, because I know, uh, Lear, you just typed in your calculator. Let's talk about how you type in, and I'll show you kind of on the calculator I have on the wall here. Okay, so if you have a calculator out, if you don't, uh, I have a bunch of those, I have 10 of those, so you can kind of see it. But if we're doing 3 to the 6 power, we'll just do positive 3 to the 6. If you're doing that, this is how you're going to type it on like my calculator, that one right there. You're going to type in the 3, you're going to find this little up arrow key, it's an exponent key, then you're going to type in the 6. So if you're looking at my wall here, you're going to hit the 3 button, you're going to hit this little up arrow key, that one, and then hit the 6 and hit enter. Boom. And it should display probably on the top up here because it's, it's menu driven so you can kind of see what you typed. It probably should have almost like this perfectly written, but then the answer would be the 729. Now, if you don't have this key, this little up arrow key, because most text instruments have that key. If you have any other type of calculator, it might have one of these keys, which is an exponent key. Um, sometimes I've actually seen it written like this too. I don't know why it's the same key, where it's, it's basically just filling in this spot. So you type in the three, you the little x to the y key, type in the 6 or whatever that key is, one of these two, and it'll do the same thing. It'll give you a 729. Um, there are certain Casios where they just have this. They just have that key. You push it, and then it'll let you use the arrows, and you can fill the numbers where you need to. Because it'll allow you to type the base and type the next one. Questions? Did anyone, does anyone not know how to use their cover to type in powers? I think that should cover all the bases, correct? If you have a different style calculator, even those big fancy graphing calculators, they do it the same way. They have a little up arrow key, just in a different spot. All right. So those are your exponents. So that's th those are the basic three rules we had yesterday. Now, obviously, those are a little too simple. So they start throwing other things like negative exponents, like we talked about yesterday, and zero exponents. And we start dealing with all this stuff. So let's do an example of a negative exponent. And then we'll do one where we have to mix everything together. 
we'll talk about cancellation method, which is something I don't think I did yesterday. Okay. Talk about two, three, y. Let's go with five, w, and I guess seven. Let's do with that. Okay, so it has negative exponents. What was the rule we talked about yesterday if you were here? Yeah. Opposite. Yeah. Negative exponents, it moves top or bottom, it goes to the opposite wall. So really on this one, these are the items we're moving. They're in the wrong spot, they have to go to the opposite side of that fraction bar. The negative exponent tells you that. That's really all a negative exponent is. That's it. It's on the wrong side of the fraction bar. So you have to move it. So that x to the third will go to the bottom. That w to the seventh will go up. And when they move, they become positive because now they're on the correct wall or the correct side. And that's it. That's literally how you do the problem. It's super simple once you start moving them around. When, I, when I'm doing a math problem, I usually wait to move things around until like the last few steps. I'll distribute powers, I'll, I'll cancel stuff out sometimes, but I usually wait to move things because it gets a little messy if you start to move things and they have to move them back later. I'll explain with one of my examples coming up here. But does everyone understand the basic rule here? Make sense? You just move things? Okay. Now, the one of the rules we talked about yesterday, if I put a negative out in front of the 5, that doesn't move. It's a negative number, it's not a negative power. It just stays there, so don't get fooled by that. Okay, so, that's the basic rules for that. Now, one of the things we didn't discuss yesterday was cancellations. If they have similar variables, top and bottom, like that. Now, I could have a very big problem, but you have variables top and bottom. You're allowed to simplify that down. Um, the rule is it's, it's cancellation. So you're taking the same number of items from both the top and the bottom that go away. Um, because it's, it's like when you divide numbers by themselves. What's 5 divided by 5? 1, right? That's just the number 1. Well, you're doing that on that problem. The real math here, because I know a lot of you know how to just cancel stuff out, but what you're doing is you're supposed to write a bunch of these. So I have eight x's. I'm not going to write them all. You guys get the idea. And I have two x's on the bottom. And what you're allowed to do is separate, because fractions can be separated like this. That. I can separate individual fractions from that large one because when you multiply fractions, you just multiply the top, you multiply the bottom, you go straight across. So you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to take a huge fraction bar, break them up into pieces. Well, it's doing this thing now. That, you know, the first fraction, which were these two, canceled out to be the number one. Okay? The next two canceled out to be the number one. So they just go away because one times one is still one. And when you take 1 times the back fraction, it goes away. And there's a 1 on the bottom, which I don't really need. So that's why when you look at this problem, and the shortcut is you take away 2 of the x's from the bottom, because that's the, the least number of them, and you take away 2 from the top, and you have x to the 6. There's technically 1 on the bottom, but you don't need the fraction anymore since there's no fraction. So, because it's, it's based on what I've just been typing here. But you can cancel stuff out. Like most people know that it's common sense. Whatever the smaller one is, it goes away completely, and the bottom ones go down by that same number. But I, I just don't know if you've been taught like why. It's because of this rule. This thing's divided into one. Okay, rules on the cancellation stuff of fractions, if there, if there is any. But most people just do the shortcuts. Cross them out. Right, this and then we're done. Just the only problem I have with doing stuff like this is people lose track. You know, they cross them out, they forget what number is supposed to be there, or they just don't see it because they were handwriting and sloppy and it's messy because you have a really big problem. Okay, let's do, let's do one problem where we kind of mix things together and we get to a new stuff today. I'm going to give you some time to work on this one. We can see what your answers are and then ask the great person to come up here and try it out. Uh, let's go. Let's 
see. Uh, let's go with 12, x to the negative 5, w to the 15, and square this. Okay, I'm going to give you five minutes. I don't know if that's enough time, if that's too much. Give me five minutes and let you try it out. I have a brave person that wants to come up here and put on the mark board and see what I can do. We can talk about it. Who wants it? Right or wrong, let him uh, do his thing, and then we'll discuss, talk about things right or wrong, or whatever it is, or things you like, or things you did differently. Work out as long as that your math is sound. So 
that you're doing the correct steps, especially the laws of acts ones. As long as you follow them, you're fine. Because it allows you to go in kind of different orders and it'll still work out. Okay? Um, but um, that's good. So the big thing here, like what I would have done, is the same thing you would have. Like that would have been my search. Don't, don't get me wrong. It's probably a lot easier if you simplify and move stuff first because the numbers would be way smaller. Um, but my, my search, I would have distributed first because it's just one of those weird, quirky things. I like to move the negatives around later. Just in case, the, the reason I do that is just in case like this power on the outside is negative. If like that was a negative two, you're going to be streaming it. And you first, because I know a couple of you in here said you like to move stuff and cancel stuff. If you were to move it and then distribute a negative sign, they would go back towards where you just moved them from. So that's why I always wait to, to move them until later. But it doesn't matter, because it, it's only to follow your rules. So. Now, I want to talk about one thing that you did correct here. And I'm just going to multiply these powers on. Okay, so just true. Now, I want to talk about how did you get your x to the 14th? Because you were correct. How did you get your x to the 14th? Uh, oh yeah, so I got x to the fourth on top, yep. and then x to the negative ten on the bottom. Yep. And I just okay. put the ten up. Yeah. You, okay, so we moved this ten up top because it had a negative exponent, right? This is different than what some other people would have done if they would have simplified it first. Or actually it would have been almost the exact same rule. But the idea is that if you were to move it up, this x to ten will become positive. I didn't have to move the other one down. So if you were to like move items around, you would have found this situation would have happened. X to the fourth, X to the 10 was right next to it. Since they're next to each other, it's still the same rule that we did earlier. They're being multiplied, you're allowed to add them together because I can't actually multiply the variables. And on the Y's, same thing, you can move them around, Y to the fourth, Y to the eighth. The Z squared. W to the thirtieth, and that twelve squared, and then you could simplify the y's. The z and the w don't really do anything with them, and then the numbers out front. Now, where I would agree with those three or four that said that they simplified earlier, yeah, twelve squared, which is one hundred forty-four, three squared, which is nine. Simplifying that down, once you have this as a nine and one forty-four, that's tough for some people to do in their head. Simplifying it earlier to make this just a four on the bottom would have been probably the way to go. Um, and then you would have squared it to make 16. But yeah, 144 divided by 9 is 16. That's why the 16 would be on the bottom. Because you'd actually divide both numbers by 9 to see if they had to be common. No matter what the numbers are, I always just try a few numbers to see you know, what works and what I can simplify. It may not be, it may not, you might not be as lucky as this one where like, the top number went away. Sometimes it gets a little messy. But pretty good. Different strategies, right? Still work. So I want you to be comfortable with that. Don't feel like you're doing it wrong because you did it differently than your neighbor. Sometimes it's okay. It's okay because, like, don't get me wrong. It might. The problem probably was a lot easier if you simplified it first. Numbers are way smaller, and you can just uh, distribute that two for it. Okay. Do we feel comfortable with that stuff? I don't kind of beat it. You know, kind of enjoy this life. But let's move on. Let's talk about scientific notation. Number 30,000. It's a big number, it's, you know, five digits. We can write numbers like this and decimals into what they call scientific notation, proper scientific notation, where it's a way of it's just a shorthand for to writing numbers differently. Okay? So what I mean by that is that scientific notation is taking the decimal, moving it to a different spot, usually it's behind the first number on the left side, or the farthest left number, I should say. And so I'm going to write like this. And then you put a power of 10 after it. Power of 10 moves the decimal. So if I were to multiply by 10, it'd move it over one spot. So if I multiply by another 10, it'd move it over another spot after that. Well, I have to move it back until it's back to the original number. So I need it to be the same exact number in the first place. Well, how many spots did I move it? So four spots I moved it, three and another one. So I put a four on it. That's what they call proper scientific notation. Now, why you'd ever choose to do something like that? Your calculator 
is only set to go so far. Now these, I think you can type as kind of as many numbers as you want, and it'll just won't kind of show them. They'll just kind of scroll. But you know, I have certain calculators on my desk where I can only type in eight digits. Like the screen is only limited to eight because of the memory that's involved. Well, every calculator like this has keys where you can actually do scientific notation. You can shorthand a really big number like a trillion. You can shorthand it down, and then you can do the math with it. You can multiply it on a different number, add it to a different number, and it will just it'll automatically spit out that answer into scientific notation. Now, what that key is on these calculators, it's the little EE -E button. It's the little EE -E key. So. What is that about the x and negative 1 key on a calculator? There's a little ee -E scientific notation. So how you'd actually type this in, you type in the 3.0, you'd actually just type in 3.0, there's no number after the, the 3. Just type in 3, then you can type in the, you hit the little shift key. Shift key is that, um, it's the second key up in the corner. I call the shift key, it's second. So the second key, if you will, you're going to hit that key. Hit the little EE -E button, which is X to the negative 1 key, because that's the EE -E button. So it should display this on your screen, probably, something like that. And then you're going to type in the number after it. And the number you're going to type in is the 4. It's the power on the exponent. And when you hit Enter, it'll tell you 30,000. Now, sometimes, there are certain calculators, it won't. It won't do that. Like it won't even, it won't even um, convert it back to numbers. It'll actually keep it in scientific notation, which is this. Now, why bring this up? Because it's a silly topic. Like in math, like eh, we can type it in, you can kind of guess to make what the numbers are. Why bring this up? Is it's one of the questions people miss on an ACT or a, a max test or um, you know any type of just formal assessment where they look at their calculator, they type in all their numbers, they hit enter. And they didn't notice that it was in scientific notation. You now your answer across the screen was something like this: three point blah blah blah, and just had a bunch of things. But then it had a couple numbers at the back of your calculator screen where you didn't notice it because it had a little e in the back and it was scientific notation. You just didn't notice. So you'd actually have to move the decimal somewhere else because some calculators like they just choose not to show the number, especially when there's too many decimal places. It won't do it. Um, I think these. Like if the decimal, like if it was like zero point something, I think it's like if it's past three or four zeros, and then there's a bunch of numbers back here, your calculator will not decide to show you that number like that. It'll decide to put it in scientific notation. It'll put it in terms of this. It'll, go, it'll move the decimal all the way back here. Since this is a decimal, you're going to have to use a negative exponent. So 2.56 times 10, it's always the same words. But now since this is a decimal, we have to use a negative exponent. That means you move the decimal back. And we move it back five spots, so it's behind the first one to the left. This is how most calculators will decide to show you that number. So you have to get used to like how it's displaying it on your calculator screen. Okay, questions, comments about scientific notation, like what it is. Just a shorthand. It's an easy way to write numbers really quickly. Or to write really big numbers small. So I don't have to type as many digits. But again, it's called proper scientific notation because we're going behind the first number on the left. So whatever that digit is. So as far as you can. So if there's a bunch of numbers here, fine, but you're going to the farthest left number and you wouldn't cut off any non-significant digits. Okay, now why I'm going to do something like this is because eventually in this class we will be multiplying like just huge numbers, just really, really big numbers. And your answers will come back inside of notation. We're going to have to do it. We're going to have to do calculations at some point. So I want you to get used to this. It's still using exponents. So you got to get used to the laws of exponents because they still apply to numbers like this. Like I can multiply numbers using this. So for instance, I'm going to pick two easy numbers so we can kind of we can easily figure out the answer. OK, so let's go, let's go to this 30,000 route. And let's multiply it by 200. Okay, easy number, right? Because if there's just a bunch of zeros, what's two times three? Six. And you could add all those zeros on. One, two, three, four. There's four here. There's two back there. This would be your answer, right? It'd be six million. But you could do it with scientific notation. 
So if there's other decimals other than just a bunch of zeros, you could change both of these numbers into scientific notation, like this, and then do the normal math, um, where it's, it would actually just turn out to be like laws of exponents again. It would just be multiplying with powers. Okay, so let me explain. We know it's 6 million, but I, I just want to prove the point. This number as a, as a scientific notation number is 3 times 10 to the what, fourth, because I have to move it up four spots. That number back here is 2 times 10 to the second, I had to move it up two spots. So that's just making sure the decimals are behind that number. And I'm going to multiply these together. Well, when you multiply, you're allowed to rearrange. What I think of is like, I think of these in the back as like variables. 10 to the second, 10 to the fourth. They're just like variables, it's like x's, x's to the fourth, and x's to the second power. So we're just going to throw them back. So when I rearrange, because these are all being multiplied together, I'm going to move the 3 and 2 out front, and I'm going to put the 10s in the back. And since they're the same bases, have the same base, you're allowed to add them together. So how many 10s do we have now? Six of them, right? We have six 10s. Because you just add them, because I don't actually know what the numbers are. We have six of them. And out front, we have 3 times 2, which is 6. Well, if this is the case, 6, on the decimal, the 10 to the 6 means that it's, it's a 6 power, so it's a positive number. So uh, it's a huge number because it's a positive 6 on that. Um, so we're going to move this decimal back to 6 spots. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So the decimal will be right here. I'm going to fill in all these little bunny loops I did with zeros. Make 6 million anyway. You're allowed to multiply numbers with scientific notation. And it still works out the same. Even if there was decimals, in it, you could still do it. You can do that with division, too. Division still works it's the same way that the problem you just did a little bit ago. That you can multiply and you can multiply and simplify numbers with that. So let's go with, we'll go with 2.56 times 10 to the third. That was kind of a bigger number. It's 2,560 or something like that. And this number on the bottom, let's go with. 2 times 10 to the 4th or something like that. So there's 20,000 on the bottom. We can divide these. You can do it. We can actually divide these numbers out, and then we can simplify it down. So what, when I do this, you would um, think of these like variables. So which one's the bigger number? Well, it doesn't matter when you, when you actually do fractions like that, that the rule is, and this is, I'll show you this back on probably just a little bit ago, that you don't need to just cross these out and put negative powers. I mean, you can, where I, you know, I get rid of the 10 to the third, make this down here 10 to the one. Then I can divide these out. But what will happen if I divide 2.56 divided by two, and um, because it is actually divisible, um, that number turns out to be, what is that? That's a one, that's a two, one, 1 1.28, something like that. I divided that number right in my head. And then the bottom number, if I divide 2 by 2, I get 1. I still have 10 to the 1 down here. Right? 1 can go away. I can move this 10 to the 1 up top and make it negative because I'm going to the wrong side of the fraction bar. And now I can move the decimal. So my final answer, if I move that around, move the decimal back one spot. This would be the answer on that problem. Without a calculator. Taking 2,560 divided by 20,000. Without a calculator, that's what you should get. That's pretty sweet when you can when you can see the, like the potential what you can do with it. Where you don't need calculators to actually divide like crazy numbers. You can do shortcuts to figure it out. Now, why I said there was a different way to do this 10 to the third, 10 to the fourth idea. I don't care about the numbers up front. I don't care about those. I'd do them the same way anyways. I'd divide them both ways. But up here, when you simplify variables either top or bottom, you're always allowed to take whatever's on the top and subtract whatever's on the bottom, the power. So that would give me 10 to the negative 1. You're always allowed to take top minus bottom, and it will work every single time. So like if we went and we did a problem over here, 
And one of the problems that they had in the book was something like this. That we know it's going to be x to the fifth on the top. But you're always allowed, whatever it is, whatever the top is, you're always allowed to subtract the bottom, and that's what you're left with. And it will always be on the top. You take top minus bottom. And whatever that answer is, that's going to be left on the top. It could be positive, it could be negative. Like in this case, I proved the point. It was negative, and that was the correct number. That was the correct number. You can always take top minus bottom and then move it where we need to later. Questions, comments with any of that? Okay, tomorrow uh, we have homework due, correct? We have what, page 15 over there? Okay, we have page 15. Make sure you're getting it done, work on it. Okay. Tomorrow we'll do a couple more practice problems with this to make sure that you're comfortable, because I mean this is hopefully not the first day you've ever seen scientific notation, but it might be one of the first days you've actually had to do math with it, like that. Um, so we'll practice that a little bit more tomorrow when you're in here, do a little more hands-on where I have you turn different numbers and stuff. Um, but we are probably getting an assignment tomorrow, and I'll be in next week. Okay. So there you go. Meg, you have your text behind Yeah, I know. Okay. Homework's due tomorrow. Yeah, I'm homework's due tomorrow, so make sure you're getting homework done. Get finished. Complete our little sayings. Okay, uh, a bunch of things going on tonight. Cross country tonight. If you'd like to get runners, if you're one of them, good luck to you. Uh, we have volleyball night here at home. It's uh, Wes Hancock. Um, student council meeting tomorrow. So if you're in student council, you know that. Or, yeah, I think I sent up the email yesterday. Like, so just we got to sign up for a couple things for homecoming. It's, we have four weeks or something like that. Five weeks for homecoming. So you've got to get signed up. More than last year, I think last year. Really, like, yeah, it was like super early last year. So. Uh, football game tomorrow night at home it's humble so you know, there'll be an overtime after the game do we know what that is yet is it not yet? I, I think it's chili for the chili all right nice i love it that's fun okay well, there you go so um today i know they're gonna have a fire drill later today so just know that in case you have anxiety about that so we have a fire drill i think it's like seven eight or something like that so it's an announced one. They have to do a couple of years, so just listen to your teachers. Listen more to go. If you're in here and a fire alarm were to ever go off, uh, we just exit these doors and go out and stand on that grassy knoll over there. So I'll just let you know where we go. So pretty straightforward.